Hello and welcome to day five of Trans Week of Visibility and Action. I am Chase and we are going to be joined by, of course, Raquel Willis, my co-conspirator and Laverne Cox, the one and only. Um, so now I am just going to sit here and then hopefully they will join. Um, we are continuing to focus on target states with anti-trans bills and um, building out an action plan resources to share, actions to take, groups to donate to. Um, so please continue to engage with us. Go do the actions from other days. Oh, and here is Laverne. And then Raquel will be with us shortly. I am terrible at this. Ah, hello. hello, hello, hello. Um, hello. <laughs> love <laughs> hey chase it's so good to see you it's been forever okay this is not okay and then, to my... i'm gonna add in raquel nope that's not raquel those are random people who are trying to join because you're on uh... <laughs> hi random people no, no one is love, random sorry i don't want to say you're random we love you but you're not raquel and therefore you are not part of this right now um but you can watch okay um, but Alrighty. it's so good to see you, and there are hey, lots darling. of people asking to join. I just want to say, I, I before Raquel gets on, um, mm -hmm. I watched you on the red carpet, and <laughs> you are just, you are so good and so brilliant, and mm. you're just you you just have such an unbelievable ability to bring people in, both the people that you're talking to and then the mm. people that are in the audience. And it's a gift. Thank you. Thank you. I had such a good time on Sunday and I have to be for full disclosure just for us just because we're friends I was exhausted I've been sort of traveling back and forth and I woke up on Sunday morning and I was like this is my first Oscars red carpet I love movies I love artists and I want to celebrate them um, I want to bring the experience to the people at home so they feel you know everything that we're feeling on the carpet and have it be a celebration of art and of um, what I love about being an artist is that we get to um, highlight the humanity of, of everyday people through our characters and through our storytelling. And that is what we need to do in the face of all this anti-trans legislation. Raquel Willis, Queen. <laughs> hey girl. Look at these two. <laughs> How are you? How are you, darling? Oh, Good to see you. I'm hanging in there. You know, it's a, it's a wild time, but I'm hanging in there. Yeah, it's a really wild time. And I have to say, I've been very, I've, I've had to pull back from a lot of my advocacy work because it is, and, I, and I've said this before, when I, you know, do um, advocacy work for reproductive rights, for example, I can't get pregnant. You know, I just believe in the rights of anyone who can get pregnant to be able to have autonomy over their bodies. And so it's not the same level of, um, it, I don't take it as personally. I do, and because I want everyone to have autonomy of their bodies and have freedom of choice um, around, you know, reproductive rights. But it is not as serious. It's not as not as it's very serious, but it's not as personal for me as it is when children are being targeted, trans kids specifically. It is impossible for me not to take it personally, and again, it, it's traumatizing. And if even if you're not directly affected, right? If you're not in the state of Alabama, which we're talking about today, if you're not in Arizona, it is traumatizing as a trans or um, non-binary person to have legislators saying that we're gonna take away the, um, your health care, that you don't have the right to exist as who you really are. In Texas, we're going to have people, if you see a trans person, you know, <laughs> report them. You know, these, like, the insanity of that is, I mean, that's crazy, but it's deeply traumatizing. And I've had to, and, and we're in the middle of a, for me, I'm still in a pandemic. I know we're coming out and masks are coming off, but I'm still dealing with the trauma of that on top of all of what's going on. And so I think for um, trans and non-binary people, I think we have to create space to like acknowledge 
how deeply traumatizing this is on top of other traumas and give ourselves space. But today I wanted to um, come on and have this conversation with you who are in, I don't know how you do it. I really don't know how you do it. Every single day, every year. Chase, we've been talking about this every single year, every single legislative session, the number of anti-trans bills like multiply exponentially in state legislatures. So um, can we talk about a little bit of that or whatever you want to talk about? Yeah, no, I think that's exactly what we want to talk about. And we want to hold space for exactly that. And yes, the pandemic is still going on. I am here at home with COVID. It is not fun. And I just want to say that that has really impacted all of this. Like we have to hold the, we're dealing with traumas of the last two years and the compounded traumas of generations. And, and so the fight is, is, is so, in, it's so in our bodies. And, and so, and it's on our bodies. And I'm just feeling that so deeply and responding to that. And I want to say too, as a kid, I always watched the red carpet and I loved the award shows and thinking back to like, well, what gives that, how do we get to be kids? And, and, and one way is to dream. And yeah. one of the things that's happening with all of these bills is that they genuinely, the lawmakers want to take away kids dreams, whether it's the dream to play sports with their peers, whether it's the dream to go to school and go to the friggin' bathroom and just be, themselves or whether it's the dream to embody who they are and have access to the medical care that I know for those of us who are over 30 like it was a, not a, it was not it was there was no possibility when we were kids and so the fact that all these young people have more are, are, are more proximate to their dreams and that's making other people so angry that they're making efforts to criminalize those dreams is so yeah. fun that's really what we're seeing so I'll kick it to Raquel to talk a little bit about Trans Week. Oh, if you're ready, of visibility and action, and then sort of what we're doing. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, thank y'all so much for just having so much um, vulnerability and authenticity around this. You know, I exactly like what you were saying, Laverne. Like, it is draining, and I think people who are familiar with us speaking out, you know. I, you know, Chase and I have our, our itty bitty platforms. Obviously, you have like the world stage. Um, I think they think of us as robots and that, you know, as long as we got it covered, then it's handled. But that's not true, you know. And I, I think yeah. what Trans Week has been all about is like getting more people energized to be a part of this fight, to see themselves within trans liberation. Whether you're trans or not, honey, this involves you. Um, but also giving some like tangible action steps because there is, and I love the work that you do, Laverne, because you always speak to the philosophical, like the healing that has to happen internally. And, and I think that people don't always understand that that is really where all of this work starts, right? Like you got to do some healing on yourself first before you can even be open to understanding the healing that needs to happen for other folks and and it yeah. needs to be done to fight and defend other folks um but with trans week you know chase and i came together last year we we really weren't seeing a lot of folks talking about the anti-trans legislation um outside of the folks who always do right including yourself <laughs> and <laughs> and so we wanted to do um a digital mobilization around it and you know it went well last year it was our first time i mean we've enhanced this year we you know different graphics different states each day right because it, the problem has just exploded you know i mean you couldn't even cover all the states in seven days because there are just so many so we have to choose the ones that are kind of most impacted this week we even had a flash action action yesterday for um oklahoma um that's mm. because there's just stuff moving there so we uh we came together and then this year obviously is the second iteration and beyond just the political education that has to happen around these bills we also just want folks to <coughs> celebrate the activists, the organizers who do this work day in and day out. Because I think for me, regardless of what passes and what doesn't, what is consistent is our community. 
and how our community loves and cares for ourselves and for each other. So yes. that's, it's so important. Like organizations highlighting today, Promo Missouri, Transformation Group, they hold community down when there's legislation and when there's not. And now, is there somewhere that people can go to find out more about these organizations specifically? It's are we going to have a a link pinned or something so folks can go find oh, out more? Yeah, look at that. It's a good idea. I don't know how to do things like that, but I will put in the our <laughs> website. And if you go to transweek.com um, and I'll pin the link here, then we have for each day we have the grassroots org that we are um, featuring. And then, do I know how to pin it? Follow yep. us here. If they follow Trans Week, the uh, account, they'll be able to find all this info. Oh, perfect, Chase. Good job. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> so elevating that, is there anything, Chase, you're the legal mind. So I've been telling people all week, Laverne, I'm like, I'm nobody's attorney, honey. So lose case. You hire me. But Chase, is there, are there any like finer details you want to put on what's going on in Missouri right now um, around these bills? Because well, yeah, different. well, so because we have Laverne, I'm going to do two things, which is I want to highlight Alabama because that we know is where you know Laverne, you are from, and Missouri, and I think, and maybe just nationally say like. We are still, we're talking a lot about Texas, but there are efforts to criminalize care for trans folks happening all over. And yes, the Texas episode and what Governor Abbott did was sensational and awful, and we are fighting it in court, and there's amazing things happening there. And if you go to our website, you can focus on Texas. But this week, Alabama is back in session, and they are considering a felony ban on health care for trans adolescents up to age 19. And I think that's important. Can we just slow that down, Chase? Can we slow that down? A felony ban on health care for trans youth up to the age of 19, my home state of Alabama. Meaning, can we just slow that down? So a felony ban up to the age of 19. So what does that mean specifically? So what that means in Alabama, so let's, let's be very specific. SB 184 is the bill. It is one vote away from going to the governor, which means it is one vote away from becoming law. And if it mm -hmm. does, here's what would happen. Any doctor and possibly any parent who brings a child to a doctor for care that every major medical association in the United States supports up to age 19. So you prescribe or help someone get care, including reversible care like puberty blockers. That could be a felony that you could be convicted of and sentenced to 10 years in prison. Now, what that means, because that people are not going to be able to provide the care if, if, if they're threatened with 10 years of prison time, within an hour, of that going into effect, all care will be cut off in Alabama, which means mm. nobody under the age of 19 years old will be able to get life-saving care that they need in Alabama. We are one vote away from that happening. Um, and mm -hmm. not only that, and, and also just to be clear, Alabama, University of Alabama at Birmingham has a huge pediatric gender center. So it would cut off care to people across the South because people are traveling from all over to this facility to get care. And if this passes, that facility shuts down. Care is being cut off from people who already rely on it and people who need it in the future. Um, and parents are then getting the message that they shouldn't treat their kids. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, of course, going to have a chilling effect on people's ability to come out to their families, to feel safe at home and in their state. And this bill also has a provision. And we heard about this in Florida with the so-called don't say gay bill, which never actually had this provision, by the way. But here, uh, or never passed with this provision, in Alabama, it would forcibly out, force school staff to out any young person who's exploring their gender to uh, their parents. Um, so what that mm. means is if you come to school and you don't feel safe at home, but school is your safe haven and you talk to a counselor, and say, I think I might be trans, or I think I want to know more about my gender, then that school staff member would be required to call your parents and tell them. Mm. Putting mm. children and adolescents and young people at so much risk. So that is happening in Alabama. It's also happening in Missouri. Missouri's also mm -hmm. considering a bill that would similarly- Can we pause though, <laughs> I Chase? It. I just want to pause. 
because I think what's really important, what I would love to just kind of break down for people, because we saw a Supreme Court confirmation hearing last week, right, where can you define a woman? What if I identify as this? Where so that so that the um, the Republican Party has made attacks on trans people part of their platform, part of their midterm platform, um, part of what they are running on, right? And so there's so many people who will say, well, children don't understand, right? This is the argument that children change their minds and are not aware of who they are and it scares people. The reason I think that they've been so successful with this in ways they weren't successful with bathroom bills is that for people who might not be informed or might not have the nuances of this issue, they might say, well, that is crazy for a child to, to be able to change their gender because there's still not a deeper understanding of what the nature of trans care is for children that maybe it's just often usually just socially transitioning. It's We're not talking about surgeries on children. We're talking about puberty blockers usually at most. And that even whatever it is that the government should not be involved in making those decisions, right? So for me, as a person who believes in bodily autonomy, the government should not be involved in any decisions that someone is making about their healthcare or their body. That should be between their doctor, and in case of a minor, their parent, and that child. So I think that the, the rhetoric that is so pervasive and going unchallenged in conservative media, need, we need to kind of, um, have an interruption of that rhetoric. We don't see a trans person in sight when those kinds of conversations and that kind of propaganda is being sort of, um, you know, consistently put forth. So we kind of need to slow it down. For a lot of people, these bills are passing because it's like children, we got to protect the children. And this is not about protecting the children. If we want to protect the children, you've told me before, Chase, that in the United States of America, we have a long history of deferring to parents when it comes to the health care of their child. The government should not be involved. And that is what in the United States of America, we should not have the government involved in decisions about health care for, for anyone, really. Um, I just need, I wanted to say that, and I think it's really important to continue to put that forward because the propaganda that is that really seeks to further stigmatize and criminalize the existence of trans people and also scapegoat us for political reasons. Let's not get it twisted, right? A lot of this is just about politics and using trans people. That propaganda is just pervasive and going unchallenged. And so I think it's important every time we have these conversations to note that and to note that, as you said, Every reputable medical organization in the United States says that this care is necessary for the well-being and for the survival chances of transgender youth. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I think you're exa exactly, exactly right. That we are being subjected to a very effective misinformation campaign that is exploiting people's confusion about and fears of trans people and our bodies. And you're absolutely right. When we're talking about healthcare for transgender adolescents, nobody is getting care until puberty. So children are not getting care, period. That is medical. They're maybe wearing clothes that affirm who they are, using a name that, affir that affirms who they are. Seeing a therapist, seeing, seeing a therapist. A therapist. But we're, we're saying, when we're talking medical treatment, adolescents only. Then reversible treatments only at first. Puberty blockers, which are used for non-trans people as well. Now, people are saying, can I tell you, I hear all the time people say that puberty blockers can make you sterile for life, that they're not reversible. I mean, it's so laughable um, to me, because I know. Can, let, let's just get it clear that puberty blockers are reversible. When you stop taking the blockers, puberty will set in unless you have some kind of other medical intervention. This is reversible. This, it, when you hear somebody say that it's not reversible, that is misinformation, that's a lie, that's propaganda. I just need, we need to say that. Okay, hi. Yes, that's, listen to the word, that is accurate. And, and that, you know, you stop them, puberty starts. You, or you start some other medication on their own, completely reversible. So everything you're being told is inaccurate um, about, you know, sterilization, about irreversibility, about bone density. We have all the studies. I've read them all, unfortunately for me. But, you know, <laughs> is 
that those are the facts. And, and I think what's really important too, and then of course there's the young people who are older adolescents who get access to hormone therapy. And again, these are the same hormone therapies that are used for cis people for all sorts of conditions. And, and, and we know that they're safe, we know what the effects are, and the benefits far outweigh any risk, period. And I think the other thing that you said, Laverne, that's so important that I think people really need to understand is that the way that medical care is delivered and regulated in this country for minors is that doctors and parents are given an unbelievable amount of latitude to make decisions about what is in the best interest of a minor patient. And the minor themselves is involved in that decision. There is simply no other form of treatment that is categorically prohibited other than this. And it's coming from the party, mind you, that is singularly focused on parental rights as their platform with respect to trying to resist mask mandates, trying to resist vaccines, trying to resist curricula in schools. The basis of all of that resistance is parental rights. These, the same people who are advocating for parental rights are saying that we are gonna so severely infringe the rights of parents of trans kids who love them that we are gonna threaten to take away your children and send you to prison for following the recommendations of doctors. And that's what's going on here. Um, and it is so terrifying for people and it is so unimaginable for people. And for everyone who says, well, can't people just leave Texas or can't people just leave Alabama? No, absolutely they cannot. Most people, first of all, nobody should have to leave their home, period. To get <laughs> first the of all, care first of all, like, yes. That nobody should ha be told that. Most people cannot. I mean, we're talking about people who have other responsibilities, who have jobs, who have family members that they're caring for. Um, nobody should be forced to flee their home in order to get the health care that they or their child needs. Um, and that's what we're telling people right now. And it is terrifying. It's terrifying for our families in Arkansas and Alabama and Texas and Missouri, where they're being subjected to this misinformation campaign. And all of these bills, mind you, permit explicitly non-consensual surgeries to be performed on intersex infants. Um, so the only minors who are having sterilizing genital surgery are minors with intersex traits. And all of these bills allow those surgeries um, while, prohibit, while prohibiting reversible treatment for transgender adolescents that is supported by every major medical association. And that's what we're talking about in Alabama. That's what we're talking about in Missouri. Um, and I think that, you know, at the end of the day, we as trans people will find how, we will find our care and we will find out how to get it for our people that we always have. Um, but this is also about the message that's being sent, the strategy of the Republican Party, um, the strategy of the Republican Party that our allies are being complicit in, which is to eradicate us and to take away our joy and to take away our sense of possibility. And that's why we're coming together and saying, no, we're not gonna let you do that. Um, we're gonna build power for our communities and, and, and resist this misinformation. Um, because I, you know, I spend every hour, mostly of every day doing this, and I've listened to the impact that this has taken on families and young people. Um, and at the same time, I see how much possibilities and, 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 and dreaming people still are holding on to. And so it's on us to keep creating the space for those dreams to be realized. Um, and we can, we just can't be complacent. Absolutely. Now, do you want to talk to us a little bit about Missouri and what's going on specifically there and action items for folks um, around the uh, Missouri action? I interrupted you earlier. <laughs> oh, no. I mean, I think I, at the end of the day, I think you can, we can go to the, like, on our website, we have date actions for each day. And Missouri also has a sports ban and a health ban, um, as many states do. Arizona, too. We have only four more days to get the governor of Arizona to veto those same bills. We are really fighting this on so many fronts. Um, but I think that, you know, go push back against the bills in, in Missouri. Take the action. Um, do the actions on our website. Those things make a difference. Um, and then Raquel can highlight um, the orgs that we're, that we're featuring in Missouri um, and Alabama. Um, and other states if you want, because I think that's such a, a critical part of, of sort of how we're building power. The people doing the grassroots work in each of these states are really, really crucial and they need support on so many levels because they're getting the impact from the families who are directly affected. They're, at, they're able to go to these um, hearings, if they're hearings, um, as state legislators, they're able to do the work, the community work that is so vital. Raquel, talk to us. 
Yeah. <clears throat> well, I guess we'll kick back to Alabama really quickly. I'm also a Georgia girl, so, you know, my, yeah, heart, I know. my heart is with Alabama, too. Um, you know, so the, the organizations of highlight there are TKO Society, the Knights and Orchids Society, and also Take Resource Center in Birmingham. And these organizations are Black trans-led, you know, so that's also important that we don't often hear about the trans of color led organizations that are moving the work and they provide so much support to different groups i mean the youth folks experiencing houselessness or homelessness folks who need access to health care right education mm -hmm. employment opportunities i mean it's very holistic because there's <laughs> needs that are not being met for trans community and let's be clear you know there there's all of the conversation around you know, obviously the parental rights discussion, but we know, unfortunately, we have a lot of parents in our society that are not equipped to fully support and understand LGBTQ youth. And so often those youth and trans youth and non-binary youth in particular are left on their own. And it is our community that have organizations, houses, if you're in ballroom culture and so much more that swarm in, and provide support for these youth. So we have to support these organizations. And then of course, in Missouri, we have Transformations KC, does so much work with uh, the youth. I can't remember the ages specifically, but I think they start at 13. And Promo Missouri, which is really the leading, um, at least LGBTQ political um, organization in Missouri as well. So we gotta support them, right? Because they're the ones if anything happens, they're going to be there and, and they're the ones that are holding it down. And I, I want to add also, because I think you make, y'all both made some important points around um, the legislation and around the agenda, right, of conservatives. This, if you are not trans, I get it. I get why you would not completely understand why the fight for trans people's bodily autonomy is so key, why our self-determination is so key. But it's completely connected to the reproductive fight that you were talking about earlier on the live, Laverne. I mean, all deserve access to the health care that we need to live our best lives, right, and to be our healthiest selves. And then, of course, when I think about voting rights, you know, that is about restricting people's self-determination. When we have all of these fights around people not being able to cast their ballots and, and so on and so forth. So this is all connected, right? You get in the conservative platform and the, at the midterms, like you said, Laverne and beyond. And we've got to be better at connecting between our fights because we need solidarity. It's absolutely, Raquel. Thank you so much. Um, I, I what it's what's really, you know, I'm, I try really hard to, you know, ha whenever I'm in public, not to sort of be angry, you know, as a black woman. Um, but I'm angry. I'm, I'm, I, this is, I'm, I, this, this pisses me off. And what um pisses me off a, a lot is is that we have like right now. Federally, we have Democrats who hold, obviously they don't have control of most state houses, right? Um, but federally, Democrats have, they have the power right now and they're doing absolutely nothing about any of this, really. And that for me is shameful. I also want to, there are national LGBTQ plus organizations who, if they're doing work around this, I, I'm, I'm missing it. I'm missing it. I don't see it, right? There's um, a list, human rights campaign, GLAD, organizations we love. I've worked a lot with GLAD. Where are the campaigns? Where is the work? Maybe you're aware of it, and I just don't know. I haven't seen it. Oh, um, to put pressure on these lawmakers to not pass these bills. And I do a lot of corporate talks um, lately that, you know, you don't see where I'm doing diversity and inclusion stuff. And I'm always saying to corporations, if you really want to be allies to trans people, you need to divest from states that are passing these kinds of laws. If, if Alabama is doing this, if Missouri is doing this, and you have corporate offices there, if you have, the cor you need to put pressure, and corporations are paying off the politicians anyway. So let's put the corporate 
corporations should be putting pressure on these legislators to say, wait a minute, if, we, we, if, if our corporate policy is to be fully inclusive and you're passing these discriminatory policies, we can no longer support you. So th this is the kind of other work that needs, I think, should be happening. And like, you know, I don't have, I'm trying to have a career as an actress. I don't have the full bandwidth. Like, this is a full-time job. It's Chase knows. So it's like the, or these, or I, I, I would love to suggest to GLAAD and to Human Rights campaign to like go to these corporations and say all of this is happening right now on your watch and all of these corporations are saying they want they're they're they want diversity and inclusion that they want to support trans people they want to support um black folks they want to support marginalized people this is where you, you put your money where your mouth is i think these are the things that can and should also be happening in addition to the beautiful grassroots work that you're doing and everything that um this trans week is about and so i think we have to um, try to attempt to hold these organizations accountable as much as we can to use their power and use their 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 access to put uh, pressure on corporations who can then put pressure on politicians. Um, that might not be popular. That might not be. But let's. I mean, we're if we're trans people are fighting for our lives right now. There is a there is a deep misinformation propaganda campaign that's going on against trans people right now. And there is just not enough work being done um, on the left to combat this. And I, there, this year I'm seeing way more um, press coverage, right, of um, t bills like the one in Texas, the Don't Say Gay Bill. I mean, last year it was cricket in mainstream media. When this is still, was, this has been happening every year. So it is encouraging that I'm seeing more uh, mainstream uh, coverage of this. But we, it, we need to do more. We really need to do more. And um, the Democratic Party needs to do more. And, and, but the Democratic Party needs to do more on a lot of fronts. Um, but that's a different conversation. But I mean, <laughs> I, feel, I think that's exactly right. Like, yes, we're seeing a little more this year because it's catastrophically bad. And we can't wait until it's that much more ca catastrophically worse to engage. We have such a reactive discourse. We don't build power uh, before it's too late and invest resources where they need to be. And I think that that's exactly what we're screaming about and what many of us have been screaming about for a decade. Like, it's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And now everyone's like, oh, what's happening? Um, but it's like, and guess what? It's going to get much worse than this, too. And that's very, very scary. Um, and, you know, why it's, it's marked right now. In June, it is very likely that the Supreme Court is going to gut affirmative action, gut or overturn Roe versus Wade, gut or completely limit the capacity of the federal government to regulate climate change. The courts are a scary place to be. And we cannot rely on that as the, as the stopgap for this legislative encroachment into our rights or this executive encroachment into our rights. We're supposed to have a system of checks and balances. We can no longer rely on the judiciary to be a check on this power. So we have to rely on each other. We have to rely on our organizing potential. Um, and that means pulling out every tool in the toolbox, leveraging corporations to do what needs to be done, leveraging large organizations, leveraging <clears throat> large institutions. Um, and, and so I think, yes, like we are going to be working together to push back with everything that we have, because at the end of the day, it's life or death. And, and, and we want to, to live. And, and also, everyone should want us to, because we make everything better as trans people. Um, and, Absolutely. and so I think that, you know, <clears throat> this moment of reckoning as we're grieving the last few years, as we're reckoning with all of our trauma, as we're looking what at, at the very scary future that's ahead, we're gonna just harness the power that our ancestors that we give each other um, and, and I think there's, there is, as, as exhausting as it is, there's so much power and potential. Um, and hopefully we can just continue to pull that out of each other um, and use all of these tools and use all of these resources and, sh and just continue to be uh, fucking amazing. I think what, what, maybe this is the last thing I, I have to say, um, but there's probably more. I also think that just on a political level, in general, what I would love to invite um, the people on the left, the Democratic Party in general, people who identify as progressive, to not no longer allow conservatives to set the agenda. They are setting the agenda around CRT, around voting, around everything. 
we need to begin to set the agenda. And I think the biggest piece of all of this is money and politics. I think underneath so many of the ways in which our government is not effective for the people, for the least of these, for the people who are most marginalized, we need a, I, and I know it's, it seems off subject, but it's not. Part of the reason things are not getting done in Washington is because of money and politics, because our politicians are bought and paid for, they use, and, and there, there needs to be a bigger agenda, I think, um, a grassroots agenda to get money out of politics. I don't know if that's possible, but we can, we need to start dreaming bigger and understanding that that is the reason our entire system is broken, that so much of this can be allowed, right? That the will of the people around voting rights, around so many issues is not being done. The fact that, I mean, I, it's, it's a digression, but the fact that 90% of Americans want background checks for guns and that never passed is an indictment of money and politics. It's an indictment of the extent to which both Republicans and Democrats are bought and paid for by corporations and by special interests. And so we need a broader agenda to get money out of politics if we want to see our political system function. And that part of the reason why so much has fallen on the judiciary to basically legislate is because Congress has been bought and paid for and they're not legislating. They're not passing anything because it's not in the best interest of their corporations. They can hide behind the filibuster. Even things they might want to pass, it, they have to get rid of the filibuster to pass those things. And then once you get rid of the filibuster, there's an accountability that has that, that would happen. And their corporate interests are like, well, no, we don't want a $15 minimum wage. No, we want to be able to like, you know, just decimate the environment. Um, to, so we can make money. So there's a larger agenda around getting money out of politics. I think that may sound like a digression, but I think it's actually really key to so many of the goals that we need to have around um, justice um, for, every, for everyday people in this country. Yeah, I, I, and it reminds me of something Angelica said on Saturday, which was, you know, I don't know, it feels too big. There's so many things like how, what, what, what is even the point? Because when, if I, you know, if I try to call this governor at the end of the day, we still have these intractable problems in Congress. We still have these problems with the judiciary. And I know that that makes it feel for individuals like, well, really, what is the point? And, and I think that as someone who does this work at every level, every day, it, it, it absolutely makes a difference. And so if you decide your intervention is gonna be to call the governor of Arizona, that makes a difference. Because at the end of the day, we can only hold people accountable if they feel some pressure. And if they're not gonna feel it from corporations, if they're not gonna feel it from Congress, then they will feel it from people. <laughs> um, and so that I think is, is where we need to energize is, is to recognize that we do have collective power, that there are many places that need pressure, that need changing, um, which means we can make a lot of choices about where we intervene. But I think making no choices, doing nothing is not an option anymore. Um, and, Absolutely. And so that That's really a beautiful choice. Is, is, where, is, where we, is where we leverage um, our power as individuals um, and collectively. Uh, and, yeah. The power of the people, the, the power of grassroots movements, the power of us rising up and pushing back is really, really important right now and not, not being complacent and not saying that like, well, what's the point? There is, there is power. And um, that's the, really the only option right now is that the people have to come together and rise up and we have to um, find a way to have solidarity um, around all of our differences on the left. Um, in the, and, and come together around all these issues because it really does affect all of us. It affects, it's gonna affect whew, the ability of everyday people to just li live their best lives. And um, this is, st I believe I am incredibly patriotic as, as problematic as the history of the United States has been. I love America and I love the promise of America that anyone should be able to, no matter who they are, live their dreams here. I really believe in that. I've, I've, been, I've been able to live my dreams in this country and I want that for everyone, but I'm not delusional to think that there are not barriers in the way and these kinds of bills are barriers. A lot of what's happening on, on, on state legislatures are barriers to um, everyday people being able to 
um, reach their full potential in this country. And that's what we should be about. Um, and that's what we should be fighting for, for trans people, for our reproductive rights, for people of color, for the least of these, for work poor and working people. These are the things we should be fighting for and, and deeply investing in, in the United States of America. So thank you for doing this work every day. Thank you for um, Trans Week and for all the resources you've given us. I hope people will go to the Trans Week website, start calling governors and legislators and getting to work. It's, I mean, that's it. Listen to Laverne, to Laverne, get to work, go to the website, take action, donate to the local orgs, and, you know, we're here, and we'll keep providing resources and loving each other. So I'm just so full of gratitude for you both, and I love you so much, and love I'm you so too, to be in the work. Love you, Raquel. Thank you. So, I'm, I'm so grateful for you. The trans community, we, we're so grateful for you. I, mo a lot of us are very, very weary and exhausted. And somehow you two, I, I, it breaks his mind. Sometimes you, somehow you two keep managing in the face of all this to get up and keep fighting. And I really don't know how you do it, but I'm so grateful that you do. And um, thank you so much. Thank you. Of course. Thank you all so much. Too. Thank you. We'll see you out there, everyone. Bye. Love you.